We need to go to the bullpen. Hello, baseball fans around the world, and a warm welcome to the Highland Bullpen Baseball Podcast. We're back, and already it's been an interesting season for our teams, for Allens, Detroit Tigers, for my own beloved Mariners, and for Yorkshire Dave's Boston Red Sox. It's been a terrific start to the MLB season, and we're delighted to be here to, to discuss that with you. So, with no further ado, let's catch up with Allen, the Detroit Tigers. Allen was probably wisely. Not too, uh, not too boastful in terms of his uh, hopes for the season for the Tigers, but you know it's been uh, there's been some positives to take so far, Alan. Yeah, it's just it's a strange one. Um, I think baseball allows that, doesn't it? That you can have a poor team, and you find moments of joy and moments of excitement and moments of optimism uh, coming through. So the Tigers got off to a, a very sluggish start. Um, ha- having said that, their second series, they actually beat the world champions, the Astros, which um, uh, half a dozen games later seemed a very strange thing to have happened. But yeah, they've, they've pitched well, the Tigers. Um, Eduardo Rodriguez, uh, was he, I think he might have been Red Sox before, I'm not entirely sure, Dave, but he, he's come in, he's, he's pitched well, he's had a couple of wins, um, ERA 2.21. Um and uh, yeah, no, he he's done well. The pitching's looked good. He was at one one game last week. He was flirting with a perfect game. He got to the seventh innings uh, before he gave up to a hit. Uh, so that's exciting times for Tigers pitching. Uh, Spencer Turnbull is back after his Tommy John surgery. Uh, unfortunately, the the bullpen's favourite bull there. He's he's put up four losses and one win. In his outings, so yeah, it's it's a long road back from recovery, and he he went for surgery. I think a couple of weeks after hit, having a no hitter, um, uh, which is probably now a couple of years ago. So th- they've looked good. There's been a few games where they've really restricted the opposition. Um, swept by Tampa Bay, everybody does. Swept by Dave's Red Sox. Uh, swept by the Orioles. In fact, I think they played the Orioles seven times already this season um, I'm sure somebody actually said they might not be playing them again which is odd that they've had a, a couple of early s- series against them early on but they're, they're 6-1 down um, to the Orioles uh, no, no thanks to Daz Cameron our, our man who's moved to Baltimore but he's still playing in the minors with their their Triple A team Norfolk Tides um, beating the Brewers uh, but 10 wins out of 27 games. I was right to not be optimistic, despite those things I was trying to talk up. 10 wins out of 26 games, I think, equates to 60 wins over the season, uh, which is a pretty poor record. The only thing, it's not the only thing, it's it's a sports rivalry thing. I think Bizarrely, they sit in third place in the AL Central, uh, ahead of both the Surprisingly ahead of the White Sox, uh, but they're also ahead of the Royals. So it uh, looks like a fairly weak division there. Um, when when Dave will talk about the Red Sox, you'll see, I think all the teams there are at least on five hundred. So so it's been it's been strange. I've enjoyed watching them because there's been times they've looked good. They've had a few uh, single run losses. They've had a few extra innings wins as well. Um, Javier Baez, uh, who was, I, I know for a fact, was a Red Sox. Um, he's been hitting well the last uh, 10, 15 games. I think I, I read today he's at 340 for the last 14 games. Um, he had a 10-game hitting, hitting stretch as well, uh, 10, 10 RBIs in that time as well. So he's done well. When you look at 340, that equates well for the team as well. Matt Veerling is the highest scoring Tiger over the season at 284. And that, that strikes me as a low mark for your best hitter, 284, followed by Riley Green in 234. If you're not hitting, you can pitch well, um, but you need the the offence as well. So you really do see from the a, a poorish Tigers team there, 
like you've got to have a combination of both both good pitching and good batting, um, or, or else nothing, uh, n- nothing good is going to come of your season. Yeah, no, absolutely, Alan, as well. And I saw the Orioles, and, and I know you, you've kind of had that, as you say, that kind of 6-1 against you so far, but there haven't been many blowouts in that. I saw a lot of the games were pretty com- were very competitive. You know, it was a couple of runs, uh, you just yeah. coming up short against them. And actually, that leads me on nicely to the Mariners. And after my bold prediction <laughs> of going deep into the postseason, uh, the Mariners have stopped doing the one thing I could rely upon them to do, They've stopped winning one-run games. They've stopped winning games that are settled yeah. by a single run. So, you know, they were the best in the league at it last season. They were terrific at it the season before. Uh, and this season, they've fallen off a cliff in one-run games. So, out of the 12 games decided by a single run so far this season for the Mariners, they're three and nine in them. And even if they just come right. out, even, even if they just were six and six, you know, not as good as previous years, They'd be sitting there with a positive 15-13 record and only one game behind the Astros. So it is it's it literally is their inability to 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 to, to get those close victories that's costing them. Uh, so I'm not too despondent because I'm hopeful, you know, the Mariners have been slow, slow starters in recent years. I'm hopeful that they can they can get back onto form. Uh, or, you know, Julio hasn't quite hit the heights of last season, bit of the sophomore kind of curse. So far this season, mm. uh, but he'll come good. He's too good. He's, he's got too much quality not to get back onto top form. I think probably the biggest worry is the, the pitching. You know, with kind of Robbie Ray getting ruled out for the season. It's kind of I think it's exposed that kind of lack of depth in the, in the starting roster in terms of pitching. Yeah, you know, the boy Chris Flexen has come in and he's he's struggled so far. I think his ERA was over ten in his first. Four, four or so games, so he's you know he's really taking a bit of time, and you've you've got yeah. to hope and expect it will will improve, you know, as he gets used to being in that starting rotation. But he is a big so far, a kind of big downgrade to Robbie Ray as yeah. well, and it is a season ender for Robbie Ray as well. Has, has he come out to the bullpen, Flexen? Was he he was there before, or was he flirting with the team last season? I I have to I think he was at the bullpen, but I have to I'd have to double check yeah. uh, double check on that. But yeah, I, I, yeah. I mean, I think you have. Uh, I think for any pitcher coming into the starting rotation, it's a big adjustment, and you know, so it's it's unfair yeah. to write him off. You know, a handful of games into that new role, but it's certainly we could have done without it. To be honest with you, you could certainly have, yeah. have done without it as well. And we're combining that, you know, with Julio not quite hitting the heights that he did last season. It's it's those I, mean, I see the small things, but you lose one of your your key starting pitchers. Your best player isn't quite replicating the form of last season, and you've somehow misplaced your ability to eke out those close victories. You know that I think that's mm. the difference, and it's it turns a you know that sixteen and twelve and sixteen currently had two of those three things gone the other way. I think they'd be sitting there. 15 and 13 or 16 and 12, you know, I think it is those kind of margins uh, that make the difference. But, you know, they've also had a fairly tough start to the season. You know, they've had a lot of games against teams that made the made the playoffs last season as well. So I'm hoping that, you know, it's a great thing about baseball, these things even out, there will be a run where the Mariners get to take on teams that they would hope uh, they would hope to do better against. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, to that, but yeah, it's not not despondent yet at all. Uh, also, not quite ready to abandon my optimism for how far they might go. But they've, they've got good, a big series, co- a big series coming up against the the Astros. Uh, actually, they, they take on the Oakland A's first, and I think that is that opportunity we talked about to kind of, with all due respect to the A's, it's a real chance to kind of pad out the win column. You know, they've got those three games against the A's. And if they could sweep Bays, and it's not easy to sweep anybody in MLB, every team's got a, got a chance on any given night and day. But Bays, you know, do have one of the worst records in baseball. And if the Mariners are going to sweep anybody to get back into things, it's going to be the A's. And then it's the Astros. So hopefully they, they, they'll, they'll make up a little bit of ground, go into that uh, series with the Astros, and we'll just see how that goes. But it's uh, 
yeah, yeah, uh, some some concerns, but as I say, I'm not not despairing just yet. And uh, but while uh, Dave Junior unfortunately couldn't be with us this evening, and his White Sox are having a tougher time than even the Tigers, uh, which I wouldn't necessarily yeah. or not necessarily have predicted. But at least one of the bullpen is in positive. At least one of them, one of the bullpen bros is batting over five hundred. Uh, or at least your Red Sox are, Dave, technically, I suppose. But what have you made uh, of your start to the season then, uh, Yorkshire, Dave? It's been very interesting, to say the least, coming off um, last year, which was a losing record, bottom of the division. Um, but yeah, the, well, just to say how how interesting it has been, just look at the, the number of runs the Red Sox have scored. 169 as only Tampa Bay and Texas have scored more runs than them this year already in the 30 games. But they've conceded 156 runs, and only I think only four other teams have conceded fewer, um, more runs than that, including those open days of only won six games out of the 29. So um, I actually worked it out, and the average score, if you work out those uh, runs scored and runs conceded over 30 games, it's around about 6-5, which was my stated favourite score from uh, from one of our podcasts last season. And, and last night, that was exactly the score that they won by in quite dramatic circumstances. And this is how they've been doing things. I think they got off to a, a good start against the Blue Jays. And last year, they were 3-16 and 16 against the Blue Jays. They had a terrible record against um, clubs in the very strong AL East division. Um, and last night it got to 5-5. And in the uh, bottom of the ninth, up steps, um, Alex uh, um, Verdugo. And he hit a home run to walk it off. And incredibly, that's um, the Bodson Red Sox fourth walk-off victory already this season. And Alex Verdugo has hit the winning run, the walk-off run in three out of four of those, which is um, it's almost unique. I think I was just reading the other day that there's only two other players done it at this stage of the season, um, you know, in the last right. few years. So, yeah, they've managed to get over 500. They've got currently two games over 500, which is 533, 0.533. Which, if you multiply that out over one six two, it would give you eighty six wins on the season, which might be enough to get you into the playoffs. What? So it's going to be close. Um, they're still, I think, sorting out their rotation. Um, Chris Sale is back after injury, and he's had two good wins, including including last night, I think. Um, uh, so. Quite hopeful there. There's lots of good contributions all around the team. Rafi is um he's had 10 home runs already this season. I think the I think the most I think he's third or fourth in in the um in the home run stakes. Um he's had 20 odd RBIs. Alex Verdugo is doing very well. And um a couple of the rookies um technically Masataka Yoshida is a rookie, although he's 30 years old. Um, he's the guy that we got from uh, the Japan Leagues. And he's doing extremely well. He's hitting for average and power, plus he gets his fair share of walks. So they've got a very good top of the order in Doogie, Rafi and Masa. So they're scoring plenty of runs if they can sort out the rotation. Um, that would be an improvement. The bullpen is looking good, and they've got, can I call them a designated closer? The first time they've had an official closer since 2018 when they won the World Series, dare I say. And uh, Kenley Jansen has only given up one run so far. I think he has six saves to his name already. He did have one blown save, but... Um, the Red Sox actually won that game. And last season, that was kind of their Achilles heel. They had 20-odd, almost 30 blown saves, I think, in the season. And um, this year they've had two, but they've ended up winning both of the games. So um, 
Yeah, it's it's hard to say exactly what's going to happen, but I think they're improving and they're already over 500. Um, so, yeah, I'm still hopeful. I would still predict a winning season and sneaking into the playoffs. Thanks for that, Dave. I know, Alan, you're a man that loves your statistics and sometimes the quirky statistics. And actually, in the AL East, which is always very competitive, no team has a losing record at the moment. The Yankees are propping up the yeah. division, but as of tonight, they're 500, 15 and 15. So it's always quite, you know, one of these little quirks of baseball, which I enjoy when you see when you see things like that. So it's... Uh, yeah, 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 I mean, the Red Sox, as you say, there's, there's plenty of, I think, of positives there as well uh, for you guys so far. A very difficult dis- uh, division, as always, the AL East, and, and a lot of quality in there as well. Now, obviously, we're an international bunch. We're coming at you uh, from Scotland, uh, showing just how far flung the game of baseball is these days. And we've discovered the other day that one of your former Red Sox heroes is very much a fan of international Baseball Yorkshire Dave, or certainly he's a fan of hitting home runs across the globe. Yeah, that'll be Xander Bogarts we're talking about, who uh, the Red Sox fans were very disappointed that um, he wasn't uh, uh, rewarded with um, a contract, but um, he was allowed to leave as a free agent, and uh, the Padres picked him up, and he's been doing incredibly well for them. Doing what he does best is a fantastic shortstop, gold glove, shortstop, uh, all-star. Um, but he hits for power and average. And uh, I did notice, yes, it, this was slightly off my radar in as much as, but I saw the headline and the story that he had just um, achieved something unique in baseball. He's hit four home runs. Uh, sorry, I've been saying more than four home runs. He's hit home runs in four different countries. Uh, we saw him hit a home run when we were there in MLB London in 2019. And he's obviously hit them in the, the USA and Canada. But over the weekend, um, the MLB were playing a series in Mexico City. And it was the Padres against the Giants in Mexico City. And um, actually, it was described as altitude assisted at uh, Mexico City's. 7,300 yeah. feet above sea level. And one of the games was 16, 11. There's quite a few home runs hit. And Xander uh, got one of them. So, yeah, that's quite an achievement. He's, he's actually from, um, he's an international guy. Anyway, he plays, um, he was born in the island of Aruba, I think, which is, um, which is, uh, it's in the Caribbean, I think, but it's a, uh, one of the it's a Netherlands territory or was yes. and he played um, for the Netherlands he was in the MLB Classic um, playing for them and um, yeah I think he speaks four different languages fluently um, uh, yeah quite a guy we're sorry to see him go but um, I guess uh, we did sign Rafi on a long te- term deal which uh, kept the the fans reasonably happy but it would night it would have been nice to to have Sandra as well we've lost we lost a few players last year when you look at, at JD Martinez um Evaldi, Rodriguez who you mentioned Michael Walker and the catcher Vasquez um yeah but we're, we're doing okay and it's good to see Sander Bogas who was very popular he was a, really the club captain Red Sox um won two World Series with him so it's Great to see him achieving uh, good things with the Padres. Yeah, and I'm sure it would have done no harm, obviously, but at that London series, and yes, he did indeed hit a home run. I think virtually everyone hit a home run in that series <laughs> for both teams, to be honest with you. But it is, I'm sure it's uh, no bad thing, you know, when they're looking to expand MLB. Uh, that We all love tight one-run pictures, jewels, but I guess when you're going to a new, a relatively new territory expanding your game, you, you like to see home runs after all, so I'm sure that was a very exciting uh, contest there as well and as you see, I'm sure the altitude probably helped uh, no end as well turning those there, uh, those ones into homers, but yeah, it was like a great achievement and it's, uh, yeah, again it's another of those little quirks that we like to see in baseball as well and I guess 
talking about that makes me think of, you know, our experience at the London series and how good that was. And obviously this year again, we will, uh, our bullpen listeners, we will be returning to the, the London series the London series this year, uh, which will be the, the Route 66 rivalry as the Chicago Cubs take on the St. Louis Cardinals, two of the real, the grand old teams of Major League Baseball. And I think it's fair to say, Alan, that we're looking forward to that very much indeed. Yeah, no, it should be good fun. Um, yeah, I, I can say it with Dave's not around, but I actually spent a bit of time in Chicago the year the Cubs won the World Series. Um, so that was probably one of the things that sort of ignited a little bit more passion in baseball for me as well. So, um, yeah, I'm quite looking forward to seeing the, 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 the Cubs come along and, and do their thing. Uh, so, it, great. It's it's great the MLB expand out, and if you follow the other American sports, you'll see obviously the NFL, the NBA, and the NHL do likewise as well. So it, it's fantastic marketing. Um, I've, I've slowly become a convert of American sports and how they manage it and how they market it, and I sometimes look at what we do in the UK and we think, well, no, we can't do anything radical or different. We can't have a Premier League game in America or whatever, but. Yeah, go and go and grow the game. Um, expose the game to people who want to see it elsewhere. It'll be a different experience. It, it's possibly easier with American sports where they're playing 162 games a year in the likes of baseball, but the NFL does it. Um, uh, I think it's the Green Bay don't famously don't get participate in that. They sell out easily. But no, I'm 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 a as an international sports fan, as you said, Richard, I'm a fan. Absolutely, absolutely. And, a, and a, just a, a final thought there, and actually a, a little uh, tip for our listeners, that if you want to get close to your team's dugout, if you're a Cardinals fan, uh, you'll be looking for the, the along the first baseline to the right of home plate. That's where the Cardinals dugout is going to be at the London Stadium. If you're a fan of the Cubs, you'll be looking to get alongside the dugout along the third baseline to the left of home plate, which is going to be the Cubs dugout. Now, of course, the Cardinals and the Cubs are two of the grand old stages of Major League Baseball. But when it comes to stadiums, there's probably only one that is the grand old stager of Major League Baseball, one of the most iconic venues in all of American sports, and that is Fenway Park, home to the Boston Red Sox. And Yorkshire, Dave, you recently made one of your many pilgrimages over the years to the home of the Red Sox. Yeah, that's right. Um Actually, we've not been for a, for a long time, and um, this trip was kind of arranged. I think we've said before that uh, this is very much a Boston sports um, household, and uh, uh, Mrs. Innes is very much a Boston Bruins fan. And we we um, the idea was to go and watch two Bruins games, and uh, the end of their regular season hockey season, uh, fortunately, just about coincides with the beginning of the MLB season. So we managed to get two games at Fenway as well. So, um, but uh, the Red Sox will be pleased to see the back of me because I don't bring them any luck, to be perfectly honest. Um, we went to two games uh, and um, it, the weather forecast wasn't looking great. I think I've told you before, I've been rained out a few times at Fenway, but we got we got both games in, um, but against the Pirates, and they were both four-one defeats, as I've written down here. I might put a blog on your on the Highland Bullpen's blog about the two games, quoting um, none other than Yogi Berra. It was like deja vu all over again, and uh, but we had a fantastic <laughs> time. I was just I was just pleased. That the games were on and we did splash out a fair bit. Um, the first game was um, we were up in the Pavilion Club, um, which um, Pavilion Club nine, so you're top tier just above um, first base and uh, quite expensive seats, but you get access to the Pavilion Club before and after, and there's a few free stuff, in, including program score sheets. And uh, you can get a drink, and uh, it's all very civilized. You know, you're looked after by, uh, I think our guy was Carrie, who was great. He, 
you know. And um, uh, the second day, we had seats, uh, the monster seats, the green monster. And these are the most coveted seats in baseball. I think the first time I was at Fenway was 1993, would you believe? And there was no such thing as monster seats then. They were only built in 2003. And um, there's there's only 269 sort of bar stool style seats. And then there's another 100 or so um, standing spots above that. So uh, the prices um, are pretty high and they vary considerably. I think we did a tour, um, not content with the two, two games, we did a tour as well. And um, we were told that in the first season, the seats were available only to season ticket holders. And um, I think the first couple of seasons. But then they thought it was fairer to give all the fans access to these amazing seats. Um, but consequently, they're quite expensive and they do vary. Ours were almost $200 each. And that's about as cheap as you're going to get them. If you want those seats yeah. in the middle of summer for a really big game on a special occasion, they can go for a thousand plus. So look right. out for them. Um, and I, I would sort of, I think you can pick up the standing ones, which are only three tiers back. We were right at the front, um, but we didn't get any home runs hit that day. Um, but just, just to give you an, an idea of the game, um, yeah, that, that second 4-1 game, um, there was a moment when we had a, something to cheer and it looked like the catcher, Reese McGuire, had hit the game-tying three-run homer. And uh, the, the crowd went pretty wild. There was a guy, a couple of um, seats next to me, who said, that's a foul ball. And he was proved to be correct. It was just the oh. wrong side of the pesky pole in... Um, in right field, uh, they didn't even go to the equivalent of VAR. They just um, the four umpires got together and um, decided that it was it was foul, and it was foul, and it ended up four one. So, yeah, I'm afraid I'm um, zero and five with three rainouts on two different continents for the Red Sox. So they'll be paying me uh, not not to go back next season. I think so. Um, yeah, it's a fantastic I've got a pretty, Yeah, I've, I've got a solution for you there, Dave, because I'm going to go and see the Tigers for a couple of games in August at Fenway. So um, I'm pretty sure I'll be the one who brings a bullpen win for the for the Boston Red Sox at Fenway. Uh, what, what would your advice be for a first-timer away fan at well, Fenway Park? Yeah, I would say get there early. You know, um, I think think you're allowed in to the ground it's either an hour or 90 minutes might even be 90 minutes before first pitch so I would get there even before that do a have a walk around the stadium the ground have a look around there's you know there's plenty of bars and souvenir shops and I would give you a very good tip and it was uh, Lorena found this out and it's called the bleachers bar and it's underneath the monster seat, so it's on Lansdowne Road. And I don't know, I don't think I've come across this before, but it's actually part of the stadium. And you don't pay, you know, fortunately we were there early and we got in and there's no cover charge or anything. You don't have to have reserved seats. I think if you want to eat there, you need to reserve a table, but you can just go in and have a, do a decent pint of Guinness, good crack, and you're bound to get talking to someone. And incredibly, and you'll see it next time you watch um, a game from Fenway, have a look out um, to uh, left field where the corner of the of the Green Monster and left field, you'll see, I think it's where the garage is, where the groundsmen keep their equipment. And just next to that, there's a, a grilled window. And that grilled window nice. is part of the bleachers, but you can actually Richard. watch the game from there. Uh, you can certainly go in and see um, batting practice. So I would yeah, say that's a good tip for you. But you can get there pretty early, I would say, you know, an hour and a half before before the game. And uh, yeah. Right. 
Lan- Lansdowne Road and expect a good pint of Guinness there as well. Is that not the, the home of the Irish rugby team as well? It is indeed, yeah. And my uh, dentist in Glasgow. And Sam Crescent, I think. Well, yeah, you know, yeah, I mean, Boston is very much, you know, um, an Irish town. You, you're not sure of great Irish bars. You've obviously yeah. got the, the Boston Celtics um, who are doing well this season as well, the basketball team. So yeah, it's all it's all good there. So I yeah, I would definitely advise get there early, soak in and do a tour. If you get a chance as well, do a tour. Um if they're not playing. I think they still do them on game day, but um, you know, obviously not obviously early on um in the day if it's yeah. um, if it's uh, an evening uh, game time. Good. Indeed. Yeah, I think I've got so on you, Richard. No, all I was going to say, uh, Dave, was: and Do you get any kind of? Did you get into any conversations where any people puzzled to hear the Yorkshire accent uh, meeting the Boston brogue? It, well, yeah, I mean, in the in the bleachers bar, we got um, talking to these couple of Canadian guys who'd driven down from. Oh, I can't remember. I think New Brunswick. I don't know. Anyway, it was something like eight or nine hours. These guys had come down. They come in down to. Um, in fact, we met some other people who'd done the same thing. So they were taking in um, that game at Fenway. They were taking in a Bruins game and um, a Boston Celtics game. So in three days in a row. So that was their trip. Brilliant. Um, so a lot of people do that, even in New England. The uh, you know they'll probably only go to one or two games a year. They'll make a bit of a special trip of it into Boston, stay a couple of nights and maybe take in one of the other sports as well. You know, you, you, you'll you see the shame what happened to the Bruins after, you know, after their record-breaking yeah. regular season, what were they, 65 and and 12, something something like that, which is, which is a record. And they've gone out um, in the first round of the playoffs uh, in Game Seven the other night, Lorraine and I watched it until three in the morning, and they were one minute away of winning Game Seven. And um, who was it? The Panthers tied it up three-three with a minute to go, and it went to overtime, um, sudden death overtime, and they they uh, they scored they scored first, and uh, unfortunately the Bruins are out, but. You'll you'll see loads of Bruins jerseys at Fenway, and uh, you know likewise. Uh, probably not so many Red Sox at Bruins games. They're all it's all black and yellow. You know they're fantastic. That is a fantastic um, occasion yeah. as well to go to TD Garden. Great. You know, great great experience. I actually saw. I probably again I shouldn't say this as well. I actually saw the Florida Panthers this season as well. Um, oh, I saw you had. Uh, yes, so. Uh, yeah, it was it was good. It was my first time. I actually got my first game badge <laughs> as well. And it was like I, I, I was all for Boston, there, especially after they charged me about twenty dollars for a can of beer uh, at, at at the Panthers Arena as well. So disappointing with the, with the Bruins on, on the hockey theme. I don't know if your your baseball teams. They all seem to have introduced a, a special celebration. The Mariners have got their their trident. They come out with for the the home run. So the the Tigers have gone for a Red Wings hockey stick, and and they then sweep it as if they're scoring a goal with a hockey stick. So it's all I a good like bit that. of fun. Yeah, the, the, like, Red like Sox, the Red Sox have done away with the home run trolley cart dash. I think they've just got a couple of dumbbells um, which they sort of lift up. Um, I can't remember which team it was recently. I saw them wearing it. I think it might have been the Angels. And they've got this quite elaborate sam- samurai warriors helmet, which they wear. And uh, who is it? The the Brewers have got um, um, a cheese head. What do they call it? A Colby. Yes. Colby yeah. Cheese. yeah to, to pretty much like the Green Bay Packers who are just a bit further north up from them, aren't they? Yeah, I saw there was some speculation, Dave, that uh, that kind of upset uh, win for the Panthers might spell the end of Patrice Bergeron's career as Bruins captain. 
uh, as well. It'd be nice if he went on for another year rather than leaving on that kind of note. But he's been a, a legend in a town that loves its sports stars. Yeah, they they really do elevate um, the heroes to legend status in in Boston. It's one of the things I love about the town. You know, I think I think when you go somewhere on holiday, you you take in about you know it's good to do what the local people like doing. And in Boston, they like their sports, and that's you know when you see them <laughs> both of their best and the worst. <laughs> you know, especially in uh, Boston, they you know they you know they they're not shy in um, you know they support their teams, but they're also can be pretty um, pretty rough on the the owners. In fact, they they are a bit dissatisfied with the with the owners right now, the Red Sox, and um, they don't sell out the games like they used to. Uh, you know, they're, they're seen as a big market team and that's the way the fans like to look at it. And put it this way, in 2018, I wrote this down a while, a while back, they were, in terms of wage roll, they were number one. They spent the most on their team in 2018, won the World Series. They're actually down to 12th um, in terms of payroll just now. And of course, they finished last, last season. So money does talk, but, I, you know, I think they're, I think they're better than that, and um, uh, I think I think they're on the right track. Yeah, yeah, go to yeah you could get three Boston teams in the playoffs in twenty twenty three, maybe. Then I presume from what you said, the Celtics are in the NBA, so it's up to the Red Sox now to make it as well. So big sports city. Yeah, I mean, we I say we are Boston um, sports household. I like the. New England Patriots, and we did, you know, in the very first visit 30 years ago, we did go and see the Boston Celtics a couple of times. I mean, likes the basketball, but and it was only because we were obviously living and working in Glasgow, and we just felt there's no way that you could adopt Boston Celtics and go around Glasgow wearing their stuff, which is, you know, undeniably. Very Irish. <laughs> you've, you've seen the, you know, their logo and their badges. So that was the only reason why we didn't embrace them in the same way we have done the Red Sox and and the the Bruins. That was probably a wise move from a self preservation angle, if nothing yeah. else. Did. <laughs> Absolutely. Possibly different perspectives from Rich and myself on that, but yeah. I, I'm with you on that one, Dave. Yeah. So. <laughs> and have you seen a lot of changes in the city itself, Dave? I know you mentioned a wee while since you've been to the Boston. Yeah, it, it, it's funny, really, because um, back in the day they were doing this thing called the Big Dig, and uh, this was over 20 years ago, and it went on for years, and it was um, it was um, to, to alleviate the traffic problems and the transport and that's all finished now but wherever we went and we were staying in Cambridge there was a lot of work going on and a lot of development certainly in Cambridge so it was just, Cambridge is where it's just across the Charles River it's a good place to stay and it's where Harvard University is so it's a very much a university town and um, there was definitely a lot happening there's a lot happening in in Boston itself as well around the, the Faneuil whole area so yeah I think it looks good for the city um but yeah it's it's a great place to be you know I would um I'd recommend anybody go there it's a um, historic place in you know it's got a big place in a in the sort of revolution um history of America and they've, they've you know they're very proud of it and it's a great place it's a it's a it's a city you can walk around and um, and enjoy and uh, yeah we certainly did that although it, we dedicated most of it to a four or five days uh, really sports days enjoying going to two Bruins games and two um, two baseball games and you know enjoying the bars and the restaurants around uh, each of the venues <laughs> it's uh, yeah it's hard to beat and you'll have a great time in August uh, Alan cool Cool. Look forward to it.
Well, thanks for that wicked good review of your recent experience in Boston, <laughs> uh, Yorkshire, Dave. That was great. And just to just to close out this latest latest episode of the Highland Bullpen, I, I want to talk a little bit about we mentioned rule changes in in the previous episode, but it's uh, to talk about stealing bases. And uh, perhaps maybe, maybe some of our female listeners might agree that a few inches can make a big difference. And it turns out that making these uh, bases larger uh, seems to have had the effect. You know, we're seeing more stolen bases. We're seeing, you know, a, a, a kind of more runs as a result of that. But while certain teams are prospering uh, and taking advantage of this slight uh, help for those who are good at stealing, Certain teams are really struggling, and I noticed that the the Dodgers uh, have, have got a major league record for the most number of stolen bases allowed this season. And I just got okay. to think, it got me thinking a bit more about you know what the changes mean both for the teams just now, but what do they mean for the record books? Because Ricky Henderson, famously the master, you know the the, the speedster of them all, that you know the base stealer supreme. You know how many more would he have stolen? But equally. The modern day records for stealing bases can they be compared the same way? If we're literally physically, it's a it's a shorter journey now to steal bases. So I just want to get your thoughts on the change to the rules for stolen bases, uh, which I, I guess make life harder for catchers because they have to be that much quicker, in particular for catchers to to, to, to get people mm-hmm. out. But also comparing records across not just eras, but actually you know the physical. Thing has changed in terms of stolen bases. So, first, Alan, I'd be keen to get your thoughts on that. I think that's a great question, Richard. Um, I, I'm going to I'm going to come at this from the basis that I think Major League Baseball. I think I'm on record to say Major League Baseball have done a good job changing and updating the rules of the game to make it more attractive and to make it more entertaining to fit in with the modern world, shall we say, or to fit in with changing trends or to fit in with how, how players are, are responding. And I look at my our own favourite sport of football and so I think, well, it, silly things like should women's football have smaller goals because women are, are naturally smaller? Um, and there's a lot of logic to me in that. Um, there, there might be arguments both ways, but I don't think football necessarily looks at some of the rules to change things as well as they maybe could to maintain the entertainment. So, so all for it, Major League Baseball doing it. As regards the question about how the records compare, um, it's a fascinating topic. I, I was going to say, uh, uh, go go with it that these are you can still break the records because they've been adjust. The rules have been adjusted to reflect modern baseball players. Um, you could make an argument that Ricky would have come up against different skill levels of catchers and different skill levels of pitchers and what have you. Uh, so his ability in the modern world might then be slightly different as well. So um, I, I'm putting my trust in the officialdom uh, as, as a stato and saying new records are there to be set. Well, that's certainly a very valid uh, point of view, Alan. As you know, when it comes to stats, uh, we always defer to yourself. So, Yorkshire, Dave, is, is that your view as well? Are you quite happy that bigger bases don't in any way detract from the game today and there shouldn't be any reason to not compare achievements today against achievements from the past? No, I don't think so. I think the, I think the bigger bases is in for a sort of safety measure, isn't it? I think quite a few players were getting injured, um, uh, you know, breaking fingers and whatnot. Um, I think they, I think I saw them refer to the same size as pizza boxes, aren't they? Referred to them as pizza boxes. So, yeah, in a bang-bang play, which they quite often are, aren't they? At, um, first and second second base, then, you know, the exercise might help. Well, I think there's other, other things going on with it as well, if you you think about the the whole pace of the game has changed because of the pitch clock. So the the pitchers are concentrating a little bit more on making their pitch. They're only allowed two pitch outs 
to um if there's a guy on first base then yep. they can only um throw the ball to try and catch him out if he's trying to gain a, an extra yard and try to pinch a base so they're only allowed a couple of pitch outs so i think they've been encouraged to try and steal more bases so i don't think it's that it's easier i think it's just that it might be slightly the way the game is being played now and let's face it we're only 30 games in we'll see for ourselves on uh, you know in in london we might not get a five hour game uh, this this time um but yeah i think i think it's just encouraged more base stealing and this is what they want only the, ba- the baseball authorities want more action everywhere, don't they? They want a quicker game, more action. Um, and you're seeing a lot more old style, what they call it, small ball, baseball, bunting, moving um, runners across, just getting the ball in play. Get a ball in play and things will happen. That's what they say in baseball. And yeah, I, I think um, I think it's a good thing. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm fine with... Uh, more stolen bases the better but it's it's no easy no easy matter and I, th- I think the catchers are getting used to it because i think in the early games the red sox gave up quite a few stolen bases but um the catcher is it connor Wong? he's thrown out a few at second base recently so you know i think the, the players are getting used to the new rules and the new emphasis coaches are having on on the game I would agree with that, uh, Yorkshire Day, very much so, in fact. And Alan, I'm just thinking the Tigers with these pizza box bases, they should get some Little Caesars yeah. branding on them, shouldn't they? Take advantage of, <laughs> take advantage of that commercial opportunity. But uh, on behalf of Alan, of Yorkshire Dave, of Dave Jr. and myself, thanks for letting us steal another hour of your time. I hope you've enjoyed a fast-paced uh, episode of the Highland Bullpen Baseball Podcast, and we'll see you again next time.